Hi, Amy the Potter. That's me. And today I am throwing some more bowls. And the way that I throw bowls, I made these last night, is I make them on, these are small bowls, like a soup bowl. I throw them on these square bats. Square bats are so awesome when they work. And, but I only have a limited number of them. So what I wanted to show you was this. So it's already cut off. And I need to recuperate this bat to throw. I had to do this with all of, I, you can't see these. Maybe you can, maybe I just can't. Um, so I need to, um, I'm gonna flip this over and put it on here. And the way that I do it is I gently hold the rim just in case it dislodges and then set it down. And so there's enough kind of holding or tension between the bat and the pot, like the clay kind of hangs on to it. And that makes it really easy where I can kind of maneuver it a little bit like this, but I don't want it to just drop. Sometimes if I were just to hold the bat and flip it over to put it upside down, the bowl would just flop and drop which I don't want. So now that I have it here, I'm just gonna very gently nurture it off. There we go. And then I also, because my bottoms tend to be pretty thin, I just gently press that. And then I have this bat, which has this magical little bit of clay already there. And that we will put on the wheel and start making our bowls. I just wanted to show you that part because uh, when I make bowls, it's just so great to make tons and tons of them. Excuse me for the noise. And then this is going to go, whoopsie, right into the square bat holder. And then this clay is just absolutely perfect to receive the next bowl, the clay for the next bowl. It's just the best surface ever to put clay onto clay. It just sticks perfectly. I need a little more hot water. I love throwing with hot water. So I'll make a handful of bowls until I run out of bats and then I have to flip some more of the bowls. Um, they're still drying out and I need them to be so the rims will support the bowls. So basically I'm just going to be hair throwing for a little while and uh, I hope that the view is okay. Let's see if I can rearrange things for maximum pleasure. That's what we're going for here is maximum pleasure, mine and yours. Let's see if we can get as close as we can to that. So visual pleasure, mental pleasure. Okay, here, I'll just go ahead and shift this whole thing. Let's see, is that in the way? I don't think so. All right, let the games begin. As always, hi, Cheryl. Hi, as always, hi, Cheryl. <laughs> as always, I was going to say, feel free to ask questions. I'm just kind of into, into this idea that I can just make stuff, hang out with people. There's always things that come up where it's kind of, there's always something to teach. I recorded last night, but it didn't, something was wrong with that recording. That's my not very well fitting bat system clunking around in there. Oh, good angle. Thank you for the feedback, Cheryl. I need that feedback. That's really helpful. So when I have this thing jumping around, I'm just gonna see if I can get it to calm down. And then I'll go ahead and make my pull. That's so helpful that you told me it's a good angle. <laughs> Aww. Today's theme for me is slowing down. 
sometimes I really race the clock with pottery and with kind of everything. I just had a really nice coaching session. I'm in a coaching program and we do practice sessions with each other. And I had this really cool one where I realized I can be a bit of a like production maniac. <laughs> And that's really unnecessary. <laughs> Nobody needs to do that. I always think like, you know, I've stopped myself years ago from stressing while I drive. I'm just like, it's not worth it. If I stress, maybe, 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 maybe versus having a beautiful, lovely Sunday driving experience, maybe I'll get there. 30 seconds faster. And it definitely is going to take more than 30 seconds off my life. So it's not worth it. Even just mathematically, it's not worth it to stress. And the same goes right here with pots. What am I rushing for? Maybe I'll make whatever, one more pot in an hour. Is it worth it? There's still going to be another hour. So I have a little stack of these bats from bowls I flipped this morning and they're just so wonderful. I just absolutely love having them, a big stack of them. The worst is letting it dry out. Um, yeah. And having like bone dry clay on those bats and then having to deal with that later. But if you can get into a mode, a rhythm, let's say, a relaxed rhythm. <laughs> um, and catch the bats while they still have that clay from the previous bowls on the bottom, still moist. It's just ideal, absolutely. As far as efficiency goes. Maybe efficiency is the medicine of stress. Was it yesterday? I think it was yesterday. Yeah, I spent the whole day cleaning yesterday. And I had a really big cleaning job for my partner's Airbnb. And I just did the whole thing just so relaxed. I never rushed. I knew that there was like a lot to do, but I just was very pragmatic about the whole thing and organized. And I like that combination. It's like if you're smart about it and you think about what you're doing and what the most efficient way is, then you don't have to rush. Hi, Amy. Hi, Sabine. Great to see you. Why is it called throwing? I've been thinking about that too. I've been wondering a couple of things like why are these called bats? And why is it called throwing? I don't know the answer to that. Cheryl O'Brien, do you know the answer? And Sabine, good to see you too. Yeah, I, th that exact question has been on my mind throwing might be a translation you know from another language but I don't know the answer to that I'm just gonna kind of uh, expand my mind here and meditate on that question and see if something comes but yeah great minds thinking alike around here we don't know if somebody doesn't have their hands in a in the mud, they could do a quick Google search and bring up back the answer for us. <laughs> and then we'd be teaching millions here on the podcast. But I do know one thing. Mm -hmm. And 
So these are called ribs. When you have like some kind of like piece of material that you use with your pottery, like plastic or wood or metal, it's called a rib. And the reason those are called ribs is that in the good old days, they used animal ribs. Which by the way, if that kind of gets you excited in any way, I would recommend this book called The Kin of Atta Are Waiting For You. That was a really cool book. I've got this mirror here and I'm do really doing my best to not bend over to see my pot, but instead to see it in the mirror. But we haven't fully organized the mirror situation yet, so I can't really see. Not so good. Uh-oh, here we go. Maybe that's part of the problem. Oh, shoot, do you see what I just did? If I can save that. <laughs> I don't know. I guess I've got it on film. I'm like, what did I just do? I just completely took out the whole bowl with my cutting wire. Okay. Back to life. That was easy. <laughs> but we'll see. We'll see in the future if this one actually survives or if it's going to that little thing is going to come back and bite me in the butt because clay has memory but the question is what does it remember <laughs> does it remember how i made it or does it remember how it just got knocked or does it remember it all did cheryl look did cheryl look it up oh my gosh wait i gotta see the old english word throne means to twist or something like that. I think I'm catching it. Cool. Look, we're doing some research here. We're learning stuff. That's amazing. I love learning. <laughs> I'm like the best student. I like teachers all would love me because I just like I really have a love of learning. To twist. Here we are, twisting pots. I think we should change it. Change it to twisting. Look, I got an idea. <laughs> this is a light bulb <laughs> coming out of my head. I've got an idea. Uh oh. Did that make it worse to move that? Can't tell what's going on here with this light. Yes, it made it worse. Like I should make up I should put it back on my head <laughs> where I have all the good ideas. The light's fine either way for me. Okay. Great. I wish I could see something. Hmm. Somehow it just never feels like I can make enough of these bowls. Everybody wants six of them. As soon as you've made a bunch, it's like, oh, they're all gone. Six. <laughs> Cheryl, how much do you sell bowls for? Soup cereal bowls. The light's fine. Okay, good. Curious. If you're willing to tell.
How, how much do you sell, sell your twisted bowls for? <laughs> there used to be an art gallery in Eugene called Twist. I don't know if that's still there in the, um, the street public market. I'm trying to get this mirror set up for myself. Okay, I think that's good. How do you make a, oh, make handles for mugs? I pull them. Uh, there's lots of videos of me pulling mugs out there. If you want to go to my Facebook page, you can scroll down or I can tag you in one. Uh, but what I do is I usually do at least 20, between 20 and 50 at a time. And I'll pull 20 short little stubby handles or 50 or whatever and then I'll stick each one of them onto a mug and pull it directly off the mug that's what I do but there's lots of ways to make a handle some people extrude them some people just kind of um, Use a loop tool I've learned recently by watching Instagram. Some people just cut it right out of a block of clay, cut the handle directly out. But I like the look and feel of a pulled handle the best. I also like a kind of substantial handle. All info provided was copied from Google about the throwing, I'm guessing, the twisting. <laughs> that is so cool that we just learned that. Seriously, Sabine, I'm so glad you asked that because I've just been thinking about that lately. Why is that, Why is it called throwing and why are they called bats? Maybe people used to stretch out little bats and make pots on top of them. <laughs> That's my guess. I don't know if you did that one. Did the things scroll up so fast? Oh, did you already ch did you already seek that one about the bats, Cheryl? Did you already seek it, <laughs> search it, find it, discover it, learn it, and teach it? I mean, I missed it. I'll, I'll be able to see them all when I'm done. Awesome. Thank you for doing that. You are the resident researcher. <laughs> You're hired. <laughs> I'll give you a big fraction of my salary. So yesterday I was talking about this Brema principle, self Brema or Brema bodywork. They are, um, it's like an awareness practice similar to how Nia is an awareness practice and process work. Most of the things that I do are kind of awareness practices. Pottery is an awareness practice, throwing, twisting. Um, but body comfortable is one of the principles. I think that there's nine main principles in Brema, and one of them is called body comfortable. And it's like about having the awareness in your body of comfort or pleasure and always making tiny adjustments whenever you could be more comfortable. Isn't that nice? Body comfortable. One of the best. One of the best, especially if you're working in a pottery studio, especially if you do production work, repetitive work. It's like really important to stay tuned into the body. Keep breathing. So thinking about my pointer here because it's 
significantly higher than what these goals are coming out to. I'll try the next one to see if I can get to the pointer, and if not, I have to reset the pointer. Because having a pointer can really help all the bowls nest and be the same size. But if you're not actually throwing it to the pointer, then literally, what is the point? I know nothing about pottery. Have never tried it, but looks calming. Oh, I know nothing about pottery. <laughs> Sabine, is this Sabine from uh, Celebration Belly Dance Yoga Studio? Is that the same Sabine? I can't like I can't see very well. Obviously, since I can't read the what you wrote. Um, it's, I think it's really calming to watch people throw. I've gotten really into it, just watching pots be made, especially when they're well made or even meditatively made when somebody's just really present with what they're doing. Uh, but I would say that most beginners would not say that pottery is calming. It can be really frustrating at first to figure it all out. But yes, I mean, the idea is that you have to center the clay. And in order to center the clay, you have to center yourself. You have to center your mind and your body. Got to be present. That's why I call it an awareness practice. Okay, that one gets pretty close to the, to the stick. I think we can leave it there. Had to return to Canada three months later. I'm guessing this is Sabine, Kathy Forrester Sabine, but I'm not sure because it already scrolled past. <laughs> Sorry. Canada. You seem like you could be Canadian from the Sabine that I'm thinking of. And I made you some like uh, belly dancing head jugs once. Is that right? That was a fun project. Okay. The funny thing with these bats is that they don't all really fit right in there. And so sometimes the bat is actually not level as it's sitting inside this hole. It's actually at an angle, which means I have a, I'm throwing a bowl that has a foot on an angle, basically. Because the bowl will still be true to um, gravity, basically. It's not going to have a relationship to the foot. But that makes me think if I ever wanted to make some really cool off-center bowls, I could just purposefully lift one side of the bat that actually would be a really cool project easy way to throw things that are asymmetrical no belly dancing we just took classes at salseros together we did cool See if I can remember who you are, Sabine. Hmm. That's so cool. Different Sabine. Well, I'll look. I, I know that when I look at your picture, then I'll know who you are. That's also, you don't really always learn very many people's names, but I'm sorry if I did, if we were like really close friends and I don't remember, <laughs> then I'm really sorry. <sighs> I, 
you know, I went back to dancing and like uh, the like second or third time I got COVID and <laughs> so I haven't really been back. Not just because of that. I also wound up getting back into pottery and so take my kind of free time now is doing this instead of dancing so much. But we'll see. <laughs> Mm. Thanks for your generosity. I guess if people are just watching this on a video later, they won't realize that we're having a conversation. This is cool. This is one of the first times that people are actually really con conversational with me. Often it's very quiet, which is also really nice. I mean, I'm happy to just make this stuff and be here. But it's nice to have some feedback. Especially about things like the sound and the lighting and stuff. You have COVID right now. Oh gosh. Managed to dodge it until now. It's nice to watch while lying in bed. Oh, I should market it like that. Got COVID? Hang out with me in my studio. Perfect. How are you doing? Is it terrible? Is it not so bad? Are you vaccinated? Yeah, it wasn't so bad for me when I had it. I didn't mind it at all. I kind of liked it. But I'm like such a loner that it was like kind of an excuse to be alone all the time. <laughs> It's amazing how many people got really sick and died of it. It's terrible. Oh no, totally vaccinated, but can't wait to get back to normal. Oh, sorry. Mm, that sucks. Yeah, it's not so bad if you feel good, but if you feel terrible, then that's no fun. I actually never felt that bad for some reason. There's a theory in process work that symptoms are filled with messages. The energy of the symptom is the message. Usually the energy of the symptom is really different from our identities or our personalities. And so if we can, if they're messages or messengers, if we can receive the message and integrate it into our daily lives or our personalities or whatever, then we don't need the symptom anymore. So one way to kind of quickly get over uh, body issues, possibly, one way to possibly get over quickly or get over body issues is to be curious about the message of the symptom and then figure out where and how you can integrate that. I'll give you an example of myself. So one time <laughs> I got a little tingling on my lip and I was like, oh my gosh, I'm gonna get a cold sore. I've never had a cold sore, oh my gosh. And I decided to write a poem about it. And when I got into the energy of the cold sore, I was imagining kind of like, it had some kind of disco, like it was like kind of sparkly and colorful and fun and unexpected and spontaneous. And like, it had this kind of whole personality. And I wrote this poem and I was kind of like a little bit excited for the cold sore to come. And it never came because I think that I like bonded with it so much. <laughs> it just went away. So I think, yeah, I just like, I liked the um, personality, what I perceived as the personality of the cold sore, obviously not like having a big blotch on my face, you know, nobody wants that. But like, just when I kind of felt what the symptom itself, if it had a message, it would have been like, 
be fun, be crazy, be wild, be sparkly. <laughs> that was like, that's the best word I could use to describe the feeling I had was like tingly or sparkly. And I just started seeing all these like pastel fun colors and like kind of this like quirky guy walking down the street. If I were to personify the cold sore, it was like this like super quirky guy. <laughs> so let's see. The message is to slow down and take care of my body. Well, that's that's kind of like a consensus reality message. Like, like kind of like we can't avoid that. But like it's like if it's a headache, a headache has a certain presentation. So yes, I want to say yes and. Um, yeah, usually when we get sick, it is a slow down kind of um, reality check kind of from life itself. But it's like, if you have a headache, it's different than a fever. If you have a, you know, a sore, soreness, it's different than a dry throat. And so whatever the symptom itself is, if you could, like, if you were to, like, there's you and then there's the symptom. And if you could draw the symptom, not you suffering from the symptom, but the symptom itself, like if the symptom itself was a character from a play, so, like, I'm imagining, like, a hot, scratchy throat. Like, the character might be something, like, devilish and dressed in red with, like, Edward Scissorhands fingers. That, that would just be my interpretation. And always oh, just like a dream. Your own interpretation is, or your own imagination is the right one, not mine. But if I had a scratchy throat, you know... It might be that, like, you know, this kind of, like, Edward Scissorhands devil guy was, like, you know, lurking in my throat. And because it was my throat, it might be something around communication. And anyway, that's how I play with it. And, you know, you have to be kind of into that dreaming process for it to work. You can't force process work on anyone, I've learned. <laughs> but it works like a charm for me, just absolute charm. It's like trusting, trusting the body, not feeling betrayed by symptoms, but feeling like they are little spirit messengers dressed in strange clothes of symptoms. Let's see the message. Oh, yeah, same thing. Yeah. So anyway, there's a book called Since You're Sick, You Could Order It. Uh, it's called Working with the Dreaming Body. It was the second process workbook ever written. And for me, it's really, really a good one. It's just, um, that's the one I usually give to people as a gift, working with the dreaming body. The idea that the body is always dreaming, dreaming at us. <laughs> I had a super crazy dream last week, which I, um, I used to, I used to do like a lot. I worked on my dreams a lot, really regularly. And then I just stopped having dreams. I just wasn't dreaming. And then all of a sudden my dreams came back. I'm so happy. And then of course the person who I did dream work with, used to do dream work, work with, we used to do it regularly, weekly. Um, and now we've been out of it for a couple of years, but she got in touch with me like the day after. Hey, if you ever want to work on a dream. <laughs> okay, so these are some clean bats. Because I found a couple extras. And so I'll make three more. And then I'm going to have to get some of yesterday's bowls off the off their bats. And then at some point I just have to be done because I'm just out of bats. Working with the dreaming body. Yes, yes, let me know what you think. Magical stuff. Yeah. Then when you're done with that, if you want, you could order my book, <laughs> which is called, I'll do a little plug for my book here. I haven't done that yet. I purposefully have not done that. I don't want to, I don't, I, I don't want to abuse my uh, my lives in any way, but I did write a book, and I think it's a great book, and it's called Can I Be Honest With You? You can check it out on Amazon if you want. It's having a good day today. People are buying it today for some reason. It's just 
This morning I woke up and I had an email from somebody raving about it. That's always one of my favorites when I get an email out of the blue from somebody I never heard of. And they're like being all nice to me. <laughs> That's really great. My book would be a little bit juicier. Working with the Dreaming Body is kind of like, like a, they're both kind of psychological books, I guess, but mine's a memoir about my dating experiences. And I have an audio book, so if you're sick, you could listen to the audio book instead. Okay, a couple more. I think they call that shameless self-promotion. Oopsie. So remember, I don't know if you were here before when I said it, but having a little bit of um, clay on the bat is so nice because it doesn't do what just happened where it um, flies off the wheel. If it's too dry. But here's a trick. So if you slam it and then you do this little push-pull thing, then you can feel when it gets sticky and tacky that it'll stick. But you don't have to do that when you slam it down onto a bat that already has a little bit of wet clay on it. little air bubble right there in the rim. You can see it like a heartbeat. Boom, 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 boom. I don't know if you can see so Oh, that's so cool. So maybe it's just sitting there like on your Kindle. Yeah, I, I used to give it away every once in a while for free. I just would make it free. And then all of a sudden, like some days I'd have like several thousand downloads. I think one day it was even like really high, like maybe, no, I don't know. The, the one I really remember was like 2,500 downloads, but I think I might've made it free for like a week once or four or five days. And in that time, it might've had like, I want to say like 17,000 downloads, but I don't think so. Yeah. Unfortunately, often when people get things for free, they don't actually value them. So they don't actually read those books. <laughs> so but it does get you a little bit of visibility for a couple of minutes. But yeah, hard to hard to self-publish a book and get people to read it. Unless you're doing a podcast <laughs> and telling the whole world about it. <laughs> okay, let's see. This looks really pretty how they're all aligning on my shelf here. This diamond shape pattern. Let's see if I can get one to stick onto this back. Mm. Yeah, I had this really cool coaching session today with this woman and it was, it's a combination. I think, I don't think I said this already combination of astrology and coaching, which I think is really powerful. If you have a good astrologer who's also a good coach, that's amazing. partner's Roomba is at my house right now and I can hear it vacuuming in the other room. 
so nice to be in here doing this while somebody else is doing the vacuuming. My dog has a little cold. Okay, now we've got to go hunt for bats. Let's see what we can find out there in the wild studio. Okay. All right. I turn this off because my foot pedal's broken. And I don't want this wheel to spontaneously spin around and the plastic bat flies off and destroys a bunch of things or hurts me or my dog. Okay, so cleaning up a little bit. So I can go, I find it fascinating that you're making them all look so similar. Yes, that's a good trick, isn't it? So it's partly because of this pointer here. I have a chopstick and it's set to where I'm throwing the rim. And so if I throw each one of them to the rim or close enough, then uh, they do all come out the same or similar and they nest really nicely that way. Okay, so here's what I need to do. I need yesterday's bowls. Oh, they're all over here. Okay, I think I can show you what I'm gonna do. And I'm going to need one of these. Whoopsie. Okay. And let's see here. I'm so sorry. I know this is going to make some terrible sound. I'm going to try not to make it make any sound. Okay. So now what we have, let me bring you with me here. Let's see if I can. Okay. <laughs> so I have these bowls, and I'm just going to check all their rims. Yep, they're all nice and firm. They can all be flipped. Okay, great. So. Get a little organized, clean up, clean up, everybody everywhere. And let's see here. What I'll do. Oh, my phone's not plugged in. Just die out of nowhere. Okay. Isn't it interesting that some people just actually literally die out of nowhere? Like or maybe that more people don't. You know, just like one day they just like, you know, didn't wake up or heart attack last minute, just not, no signs. And then other people have these like really long death processes. Okay, I'm gonna bring this over here just because it's easier and you can see I'm doing this for you guys. So here's how I'm gonna flip them and clean this guy up a little bit because I can tell been through something. This one went through the war zone. Check to make sure it was cut, which I can kind of see underneath. I get this bat like this. So, I mean, the bowl, I hold it so my fingertips are on it. So when I flip it over, just in case it falls, I can catch it. And gingerly pull it off and give it a little press. I don't think you could see that one, but as soon as I get over here, hopefully you'll be able to see it. Is that true? Yeah, I think so. So check to make sure it's cut, turn it over, and gingerly pull it off and gently press in there. Okay, we're getting some nice bats here for me. Like this, like that, gently down, gently off, and gentle press. 
Next, like this, like this, upside down. I um, I had like a military style. That's what I like to call it: military style pottery training. I went and I did an apprenticeship out of college. Um, just like when I graduated college, nineteen ninety two. I got a job out of the back of a ceramics monthly magazine at McQueenie Pottery in McQueenie, Texas. I just thought that was just the absolutely perfect, perfectly random place to go, <laughs> not knowing what I was going to do with my life. I was like, McQueenie, Texas, here we come. <laughs> and... um It was the most amazing education, pottery education. It was just really, really, really a special. I'm gonna put this last one right here on this banding wheel because I'm not out of space. Oh, this one's not coming off as easily. Okay, okay, great. So, and I've been reconnecting with lots of those potters. One of them I fell in love with and, uh, we moved up here to Oregon together. We're not together anymore, but um, I still really love him. And he was my main teacher. And he's one of the best potters I've ever seen, for sure. I used to say I thought he was the best in the world, but I'm not sure about that. Oh, Kenji, hi. Okay, we're going back to the wheel now. I'm going to very gently move this, try not to make too much terrible noise for you. Okay, and let's lower you down. Here you go, maybe a noise, probably. Okay, and how's our angle and everything? Is that pretty good or maybe a little more tipped? Would be better. Let's see here. Does that look good? Hopefully that's good. Okay, yes. Let's call it good. All right, so now we can make two, four, six, at least seven more, and maybe I'll sneak in a couple extras somehow. I know where one more is. I have this whole box of them, but they're all disgusting. I should, uh, should do something with those disgusting ones to make them a little less disgusting. Okay. Kenji, I think we know each other from process work. Is that the right Kenji from Japan? been really stalking myself for the unnecessary moves and I just did one I just put my sponge in the water but it already had plenty of water in it that was an unnecessary move at one point in my throwing career I realized I was like Picking up the sponge, putting it down, picking it up, putting it down. And I train myself to keep it in my hand. There are a couple times when I throw it away, put it in the water bottle, in the water bucket, but mostly I like to keep it in my hand until I'm done with it.
also, I want to make other bowls too. I have this like, I want to, with mugs I did it. I want, I wanted to do thrown and altered pieces. So I guess what I'm telling myself is I'll make what feels like enough of these regular bowls first, maybe a hundred of them, and then I'll branch out. But I, I don't want to wait too long because I want to feed the part of myself that's hungry for the new instead of just like mass producing the old style, which is this. This is These are my same old bowls that I always made. Ooh, this had a little bit of cinnamon in it. The color cinnamon, there's a the same company, Georgie's, makes a cinnamon. This is called dark chocolate trail mix, this clay, but they also make a cinnamon. And I just found a little bit of it in this bowl. Pink. It's pretty. So yeah, I have a couple of, at least two, before I'm done here today, I'll make at least two new style bowls. And I really just kind of have to forge, either I'll have to go and watch some videos and pick one or or just kind of experiment until I settle on one that I like. But it's really easy for me to just get into like crank them out production mode from my military style pottery training, where that's what we did. We cranked them out. Here, I'll show you what's going on with this clay. <laughs> I wonder if I'll find any more like this. This bowl is funky. Okay. Wow. Very unexpected. Okay, here I'll show you. Let's see if you can see that. See all that pink in there from the cinnamon clay? That's cool. All right. One of my greatest disciplines is to not make this foot too thin. I cut it just a little too close almost every time. And I really, that's another thing I'm working on is leaving just a little bit more clay down there. So body comfortable is constantly seeking comfort or pleasure in the body. And then there's lots of other bream of principles. One of them is called nothing extra, no extra. And I use that a lot with pottery, just what's needed. Not a ton of extra pulls, not a lot of messing with the clay. Get in, get out, no extra. Last night, my dog got out of my backyard and she's in heat. And we are wondering if she might be pregnant, which would really be a bummer. It's not really what we are planning on right now. That's the time I put the sponge in the water.
<laughs> it's just thinking, you know, there's so many variables in pottery, like the kind of clay you use, the way that you work with the clay, the temperature you fire to, the glazing style you have, how much you do. There's just so many variables. So I was just thinking about this friend of mine. His name was Chris Gum. He was one of those people who unexpectedly died early when he was 52. I actually have some of his tools, which is magical and amazing. Um, and one time I ran into Chris and we were talking about Reclaim. And I was like, what do you think you should make with Reclaim? And he said, big stuff. I was like, okay. So I went and I made a bunch of big stuff with, <laughs> with Reclaim. And I came back to him and I was like, you know, whatever. All the plotters cracked. <laughs> he said, oh, okay. Small stuff. <laughs> there were two really special potters who died um, that were really special in the Eugene community. And one was Chris Gum and the other was Tom Rohr. And they both died young and unexpectedly. Tom had a heart attack, I think. Um, both of them just like really special potters. Like they both just had certain flares that were so unique to them. And Tom was so fun. He used to do these demos, but his demos were mostly cooking demos. He'd make like aioli and he'd feed us all. And so... They were always very dynamic. He was just such an extrovert, such a fun guy. Chris was a lot more quiet. And... But they both made really special work. That's one thing about a potter. Like, once they're gone, you know, they're not making any more pots. So whatever you have is really special. I have, I've had, I don't have that many potters' pots, but I do have both of their pots. Somehow I knew to get them. Chris, I think Chris, I might have bought one mug and he gave me the other, or he might have given me both mugs, which is really nice. I mean, I was never, well, I guess I have given a lot of things away, but. I was always really surprised when he would do that and give me a mug. And uh, I like to think that he had a little crush on me. <laughs> I see that Alfred Wayman is here. And I know that you do a bunch of lives, too. I've seen you on some lives before. Fun. Nice to have you visit me here in my little live living room. Or whatever you call these things. Sorry if you can hear the noise. That's my sexy Roomba doing my dirty work for me. Oh no, we're running out, friends. Two more. Oh, I know. We can at least do three more. I have that one over there. I can steal that one. For sure. Small pots um, are, for me, are harder to make than, than big pots. <laughs> if the clay is a little bit hard, which this one is, it just takes a lot of effort to center a small pot. I so want to do a purple rain show where all the pots are purple. Fun. <laughs> do it <laughs> you can play prints in the background 
I love purple. I'm sure you can tell. I got a little purple thing going on here. But I like a lot of things. I like a lot of colors, especially with pots. I have a green that I really love. Green and purple together, I really like a lot. <laughs> I find that often, you know, my favorite colors are like the of pots or the favorite glazes. They're the ones that kind of stand out and make the booth look really pretty. Without them, the booth looks kind of drab. But if they're the only thing I have, I don't tend to send them, sell them very well. But I think it could be a niche. Some people just make white pots, you know, or every single pot, same glaze, blue pots. I wouldn't be happy doing that stuff. Do you have a purple glaze that you love? Is it called Purple Rain? I had a friend here. I think he had a glaze called Purple Haze. That's what it was called. Ray's Haze. Yep, definitely. Ray. Worked for the post office. Ray's Haze. Okay, let's see. I'm really chopping up this bed. Okay. Two more, and then I'm going to have to regroup, figure out what the plan is. Running out of bats. Running out of room on the shelves, too. Uh -huh. Running out of boards. Wear boards. Okay, I think I can source some from other places in the studio. Still working production or making my own pots to sell? Uh, kind of a little bit of both. I mean, I'm definitely working in production for myself. I, I only did production for another person during my apprenticeship. That was in the early 90s. Um, I worked at a production pottery. Taught me everything I needed to know, pretty much. And... Since then, I've been on my own since the early 90s, but I'm only working a couple hours a day now, and I haven't actually figured out how I'm going to, I haven't fired anything since I started making pots again. I've been making pots now for like, probably like about a month, I guess, and my, my studio is getting pretty full, and it's going to be time to do some glazing and firing soon, but I'm, I'm trying to maximize. This is how I've always worked, is like, just like until like there's just absolutely no room left in the studio. And then it's kind of like, okay, we got to glaze these and get them out of here. But I'm like kind of oblivious slightly to the holidays and sales. And I don't know how I'm going to sell these. I don't have a plan. I'm, I haven't thought that far ahead yet. When I went back to doing pottery, my partner was kind of, the one who really was like, you've got to go back to doing pottery. I was like, okay, but the one part I never, well, I, I didn't mind it so much when I was actually, I do like selling and meeting my customers, but all the hauling the pots around all the time, whew, that was a lot of stuff and a lot of time. Um, maybe I'll turn my living room into a gallery or something. But I basically told my partner he's in charge of figuring out how we're going to sell them. I do that also. Building now for the Christmas show Black Friday weekend. Yeah, I wonder, will I be ready with anything for Black Friday? I don't know. Where do you live? Let me see if I can grab this. Whoopsie. Oh, I got some leakage going on here. I run Creek Road Pottery, Pottery in Laceyville, Pennsylvania. Cool. 
cool. You run a pottery. So does that mean you have employees and that kind of a bigger operation with several wheels and several kilns? If I could do it, I'd bring you on live if you want to come on live and chat. I think we should go live together. Let's go live together and clay buddy sometime. We can do like a showdown. <laughs> hmm. All right, this has been a pretty good run today. Nice and easy. Smooth. Wasn't fighting the clay as much as I was last night. Last night I just felt like I had so many that I lost. Or not lost, but it was just like they'd start wobbling and I had to save them. It's just like high maintenance pots. <laughs> and that needs so much for me. <laughs> sure, that would be a fun time. Yeah, go go live together. I think that would be really fun. Um, I guess our time difference is a little challenging. I often work at night. Today I'm working during the day because I just had the time. Uh, but I'd like to actually make the time. Okay, let's see what we got in here. Anything salvageable? Oh, I think I can use some of these. These are all pretty much so disgusting. <laughs> okay, no, but this is okay. Let's see if it'll fit in here. Yes, great. We are rocking still. Uh-oh, I just realized I only have a spot left for one more bowl down there. Okay, that's not as big of a problem. I can get one more wear board or two. Unfortunately, I can't read it, but I'm glad that you told me about what you have going on there, and I'll read it later. It's like all kind of like dot, dot, dot. <laughs> it's not legible right now. But hey, I've got a trivia question for you. I know the answer only from this live broadcast. Somebody else looked it up earlier, Cheryl O'Brien, my, my chief researcher. Um, do you know why this is called throwing, throwing pots? Oh, actually, you have access to the chat, <laughs> and I don't, so, so you can figure it out. Hooray. Oh, I don't know what that's about. Hooray. But yay. <laughs> I'm excited too. About going live together sometime. That'll be fun. We can pull the crowd in. Okay. I'm not sure why I've never looked. Right. I was wondering it earlier this week, and then somebody was on the broadcast earlier, and she asked the question. She's not a potter, but just was a curious person. And I was like, oh, my gosh, I was just thinking about that, and I had never even thought about it before. Just kind of 
accepted that throwing is just throwing. Now, I, because I'm barely able to read what's happening as the messages go by, it would be better for you to go check. But what I got from Cheryl O'Brien's uh, message is that it's from like the old English, <laughs> English, <laughs> English to twist. It's from the word twist. To throw means to twist. So we are really twisting clay. Wouldn't that be funny if that was the word that caught on instead of throwing? Twisting. I think I'll go out to the studio for some twisting. I'm gonna go do some little bit of twisting. Okay, now I need to do a couple things. We've, we've hit a point where there's some rearranging that needs to happen. And, and as I do this, I realize I actually, many things need to happen, including me going to the bathroom. So I think that this will be the momentary end of the live podcast. Today's episode, which I believe will be episode number five. I think I'm going to trash yesterday's because it was like, <laughs> um, I'm calling it wisdom from the wheel. So thank you. It's great to have you here, Alfred. And everyone and I I will uh, look back through all the comments and read them and comment back on them and I'll see you here hopefully soon next time. Ciao!